Okay, if we could turn in our Bibles this morning, please, to the book of Galatians and the second chapter. And we're going to read from verse 11 uh, down to the end of the chapter, 11 down to verse 21. And we want to think together this morning about legalistic intimidation. And uh, we're going to find that sometimes uh, legalistic brethren can have a powerful intimidation of other Christians and really affect them uh, tremendously. So we want to think about that particular topic uh, as we consider this portion together. So beginning in verse 11, it says this, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So we've, we've already looked at a couple of these uh, verses previously, but I felt like just for the context and flow of thought would be good to read from verse 11. But really, we were considering last time as we ended verse 12, and we learn about these certain men uh, came down from James and he did, uh, up to that time, Peter ate with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And so the arrival of these uh, individuals revealed a weakness in Peter's makeup. He was vulnerable to pressure uh, from a strong um, uh, kind of character like these uh, legalistic brethren. And so uh, this exclusive Jewish teaching really had an impact on him. And of course, I think many of us, to some degree or other, have experienced something like this, where uh, maybe uh, legalistic brethren, type brethren, whatever you want to call them, have had a powerful influence on us, even making us modify our behavior. Well, that's certainly what is going on here in the terms of Peter. And uh, of course, that this weakness had been seen before, in him, uh, remember, he's. this is the, the man that said, though all deny you, Lord, I will never deny you. And, uh, you know, making tremendous statements, he was going to willing to, to die for Christ, all the rest of it. And yet we see the same man, again, intimidated by the legalistic mob, uh, so that a little maid causes him to deny the Savior. And so obviously, this is a character trait we find in Peter, uh, that uh, we, we've seen it before, we see it again here, that he's intimidated by powerful personalities. So what happens is they withdraw from table fellowship with Gentile believers. 
And we need to recognize it's not prompted by any theological principle, but by fear of a small pressure group. He still believed the gospel, but he failed to practice it because of the pressure group that was exerting some pressure upon him. And uh, Mr. Luther, he his commentary on Galatians is very interesting because, of course, it was so instrumental uh, in the Reformation. And he says, no man's standing is so secure that he may not fall. If Peter fell, I may fall. If he rose again, I may rise again. We have the same gifts that they had, the same Christ, the same baptism, the same gospel, the same forgiveness of sins. And so Luther just reminds us that what we see in Peter, uh, he that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he also fall. We're also capable of the same hypocrisy of being intimidated by certain brethren from certain places that exert pressure upon us. And so what's so significant about this is that Peter was the first man to learn the truth of the Gentile admission to church fellowship. We remember back in Acts chapter 10, and he is now the first to withdraw from it. Of course, the reason he's given is that he feared the Jews. And when uh, afraid that, uh, for what? Re what reasons? Was he afraid that report of his fellowship with the Gentiles would would mar his status in the Jerusalem church? Uh, did he want to remain popular uh, with that crowd, even at the expense of setting aside truth? And, and again, we can see that this, this kind of thing, the, the idea of being accepted with a peer group, that's a powerful pressure. Uh, it's not just uh, our young people face that pressure. We face that pressure too. Do we want to be accepted amongst the boys? Do we want to be uh, one of the in crowd? Or are we willing to stand on truth uh, and uh, not be intimidated that, by them? And, of, of course, uh, standing for truth sometimes can lose your friends. Uh, again, not long ago, I read the biography of Spurgeon. And when he stood for truth, he lost a lot of friends during the downgrade controversy. So, you know, it's not the love of the law of Moses that was really behind Peter's actions, but it was fear of man. Fear of man bringeth a snare. We've been talking about in the previous session that Peter was one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem, but we can see at this point it was a pretty wobbly pillar. <laughs> it's not standing so erect and so firm at this moment. It's, it's wobbling because of intimidation. On the other hand, Paul stands in vivid contrast. He cared not for favor with the Jews or any man and was willing to pay the price for loyalty to the truth of the gospel. And so it is quite a contrast. Because it says uh, these uh, certain came from James, and we wonder, uh, did they uh, really come down sent by James or did they just claim that they had come down? from James. We can't be dogmatic about it, but it would seem that uh, James previously had given the right hand of fellowship uh, to Paul. And so as he changed his views as well, or are these people just saying that they're, uh, they're representing James and therefore bringing with them that kind of uh, pressure uh, with them? So notice verse 13, and, and the tragedy is that, that Peter's um, failure to stand affects others. And so it says in verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise. That word dissembled, dissimulation means they played the hypocrite. And so it tells us other Jews, so it's not just Peter now, but other Jews are catching on to this. They're also intimidated. They're also stopping eating with Gentiles at the love feast and all the rest of it. And then he says, in so much as uh, that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. We don't know what it was about these certain men from James that made Peter afraid, and now Barnabas as well. Uh, was it that they were men of strong personality? Uh, maybe they had prestige and influence. Perhaps it was they made threats of one kind or another. 
Perhaps it was financial. It is interesting uh, how financial pressures can be exerted. In, in other words, uh, if you, and of course, remember, Peter had a wife, and we know that, uh, if if you uh, if if you continue this conduct, we're gonna we're gonna affect you where it hurts the most. We're gonna stop your financial support. That could have been part of the pressure that was exerted. And uh, again, uh, some of us have uh, experienced that in the past, uh, where where again, uh, if you don't say shibboleth the way we say shibboleth, uh, we'll stop supporting you. And so there's that kind of intimidation. Whatever it was, it was very effective and so strong that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And and so uh, Barnabas is a bit of a surprise because he's been such a, a champion of grace all along. Uh, Barnabas was Paul's trusted friend, uh, an associate. Barnabas uh, stood beside Paul when he first met the apostles in Acts chapter 9. When nobody would be willing to commend him, he acted as his letter of commendation. Uh, he, we, we read about him that he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit, uh, that when the work in Antioch needed help, he went and got Paul. And so these guys have been together in the trenches. They've uh, they've stood together for the gospel of the grace of God. And now even he is affected. So the defection of Barnabas in some ways was a far more serious nature with regard to Gentile freedom than the vacillating of Peter. Barnabas, the foremost champion of Gentile liberty next to Paul, had become a turncoat. When we estimate the character of Barnabas, we should not forget this incident. There's so many good things about Barnabas, and we thank God for every marvelous trait we see in this man. But at the same time, it shows one of the dangers of a loving nature. And of course, he has a very loving nature. And one of the dangers of a, of a loving nature is theological compromise. We don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to be on everybody's side. So to Barnabas, no doubt, was a simple matter of love. He didn't want to grieve the brethren from Jerusalem. So in his mind, a brief abstention from fellowship with the Gentile believers uh, would all that would be needed uh, to keep the Jerusalem brethren happy. And once the Jerusalem guys had gone back, uh, he could resume his fellowship uh, with the brethren in Antioch uh, from a Gentile background. But to Paul, this was peace at any price, and he was not willing to stand by and let this happen. He wasn't prepared to buy peace on those kind of terms. Could it be that this incident produced a temporary feeling of distrust between Paul and Barnabas that would result in a later fracture between these two men? Remember, they had strong, contentious words with each other in Acts chapter 15. Maybe the memory of this incident certainly would contribute to that at a later date. And so it's just interesting to consider these matters. But it just shows that this matter was now bigger than just Peter. And now Barnabas is involved. And notice again in verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. I mean, if Peter and Barnabas are not eating with Gentiles, we're not going to either. And so pretty soon, nobody wants to eat with the Gentile converts. The rest of the Jews at the church in Antioch followed Peter and Barnabas's example. That shows what a heavy responsibility it is to be in leadership. When we go astray, others will often follow. You see, remember, those in leadership roles are meant to be in samples to the flock, a pattern to follow. And so a wrong move in leadership can have profound effects on the whole congregation. And so in this case, Peter virtually separated the Jewish believers from their Gentile brethren. I'm not going to eat with you, causing a, a, a potentially a com complete cleavage in the assembly. It destroyed friendship, harmony, agreement, fellowship that had bound them together 
and it's all hypocrisy. It's playing a role while those other brethren, those intimidating legalistic brethren are there. And it's tragic. And of course, what's so ironic about it is Peter was the man who confronted Ananias and Sapphira about their hypocrisy. And now he is playing the hypocrite. And again, isn't it so much like all of us? So often we can see clearly faults in others and we're blind to our own condition. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's the same thing, the thing we see in somebody else, and it's the very same thing in our hearts. And we certainly see this hypocrisy, the sham in Peter's heart at this time. And again, what we could say is this, fear of man not only brings a snare, but fear of man produces hypocrisy. You see, you know what's needed to please these kind of brethren, and so you do the act. You wear the right outfit, carry the right Bible, uh, you say the right words, and you're just putting on a performance. And the whole thing is hypocrisy. It's not your conviction. You just want to be accepted. You want to be part of the in-group. You you want you want to keep the financial support coming. You want to you don't want to offend anybody. You want to be part of this this powerful in-group, and so you become a first-class hypocrite. And what is it that the Lord hates so much in the Gospels? What what was his issue with the the Pharisees? They were hypocrites. He, he said. Uh, do what they say, but don't do what they do because they say and do not. In other words, they're really good hypocrites. Don't become one. And repent if you've ever been one, <laughs> right? Because it's so easy to do that. Look at verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You must notice that Paul's motive here, he doesn't oppose Peter because he loved an argument, nor because he wanted to score a point over Peter, but he tells us, you walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. His motives were absolutely pure. This confrontation was all about the truth of the gospel, and therefore it was so important. And before we confront anybody, and of course there is uh, in scripture the need to admonish one another, right? It's, it means lovingly confront, and so this is something that we should be doing, uh, and not, not looking for opportunities to do it, but when it's needed, we should be willing to do such a thing. And if we do such a thing, we want to be really sure that our motives are right. Is it the cause of the gospel? Is it the honor of the person of Christ? Or is it a chance to get back at this brother who I've wanted to get at for a long time, and now is my opportunity to pin him to the wall? And so we have to be very careful that our motives are pure, as we do these kind of things. That's why it says in Galatians 6, 1, it says, you that are spiritual, uh, right? Make sure that you're under the control of the Holy Spirit. Restore such a one with the spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. And so this idea of motivation, it's all about the gospel for Paul. He's willing to lovingly confront Peter because uh, that's what admonition is all about. He withstood him to the face rather than talk to him behind his back. By the way, that's a very good principle, isn't it? It's so easy to talk about people behind their backs, but instead of doing that, he confronts Peter to the face. And, and we've said he does it in a public way because the sin was public, and of course public sin requires public uh, action. And so he lovingly confronts him. And uh, he does it uh, because... Again, Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> and, and again, the, if we really care about somebody, we don't want them to continue acting the hypocrite. We want to uh, 
confront that. And so that's exactly what Paul is doing here, because the gospel is at stake. And so he says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly, uh, that means literally walk in a straight path. Peter and others had deviated from the straight path of the gospel. It's very emphatic what he says now. He says, if you, born and bred a Jew, disregard Jewish customs, and Peter had already done that, right? He was already eating with the Gentiles before the men came down. So he had already broken with the Jewish customs. When he went to Cornelius' household, he'd already broken the Jewish customs. So Paul says to him, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles. And he had already done that, right? You don't go to Cornelius' house and say, uh, I'm here, but you have to cook a kosher meal for me. You just don't do that, right? You just, you go there and he, God has showed him that, that he had made uh, everything that had been in that net. God had take, said, don't call that which is, that God has cleansed unclean. And so he had eaten with him, and he had eaten with Gentiles in Antioch. And so now he is compelling the Gentiles to live as Jews. By this action, he's, he's saying, you know, if you really want to be part of the, the accepted brethren, you have to become like us. You have to get circumcised. You have to accept the law. You have to do all these things. That's what he's really saying, because... Only then can we eat with you. And so he says, well, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And that's what he's doing. Uh, they either had to put themselves under law to preserve harmony, which was a denial of the truth of the gospel, or accept an open division in the church that's what it comes down to you follow what we're doing or there's going to be a cleavage we can't even eat with you and so what a, what a tremendous situation we find ourselves in here by the way it's just good to remind ourselves that uh, that, that in peter's favor i want you to look at second peter 3 we, i think we may have mentioned this in the q a session but i love this verse second peter 3 this is much later and uh, Peter writes in verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our, now notice these words, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. No, so what this does teach us is that even though in a public way, Paul confronted Peter, Peter got over it. Now, that makes a, a, a big impression, doesn't it, in our minds? Because um, when you're confronted in a public way like that, um, if you let pride get the better of you, you, you could be resentful for the rest of your days. He showed me up in a public way. How dare he do that? What did he do to my dignity? And, and, and you could end up uh, with seething resentment. But obviously, Peter had allowed this loving confrontation to correct him. And we see that he talks about Paul and he uses the most beautiful language, our beloved brother, Paul. And let's just say this, that if we have to be confronted, and may God preserve us from that, from being the hypocrite that needs the public confrontation. But if that ever happens, why well, it's a giant thing to recover from something like that in a good way. It's a huge thing to be able to receive the correction and then not only receive the correction, but even speak in loving terms of the person who confronted you. Peter has gone down in my estimation and up in my estimation in just a couple of verses, right? <laughs> it's just amazing to see uh, these things. And so verse 15, it says, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. And so there's a problem as to where Paul's words to Peter end and the teaching begins. Um, is, is this part of the same sentence? 
uh, that we've just seen in verse 14. Uh, it seems that Paul is addressing Peter and the assembled church because it's done in a public way. He's doing it before them all. And so in a sense, he's confronting Peter, but he's giving a lesson to everyone. And so having rebuked Peter, he includes the whole company in his address, setting plainly before them this basic teaching. But this teaching sums up the whole letter. And it does seem to mainly be directed, though, to the Jewish section of the church uh, uh, as he contrasts justification by works and justification by faith. And so, again, let's just get the flow here. If thou, again from verse 14, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he's saying is, we have come to realize the importance of justification by faith. We Jews, we've come to realize that. So why would we impose a system on the Gentiles that never worked for us? It didn't procure salvation for us. It didn't procure holiness for us. And so from really from verse 16 and 17, we move into this marvelous teaching section where he's going to talk about justification. He's going to mention the word justified four times in verse 16 and 17. And of course, it's the basic doctrine of the letter. And so um, this this word justified or just that he uses, um, again, it's, say it's the first time he uses it in the letter uh, to the Galatians. And it's good just to remind ourselves, what are we talking about when we talk about justification or justified? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And he says, we are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles. We know that. We understand that. We get it. We, I mean, that's why they believed in Jesus, the Messiah, was not just because he had the messianic criteria, because they realized the law couldn't save them, and they needed a Savior, and that Christ was that Savior. And so what is this idea of justification? And it really is a, a legal term, a legal concept, the person who is justified is the one who gets the verdict in a court of law. And so it, it means somebody who is declared righteous in a court of law. And of course, in uh, the spiritual sense, it means getting a favorable, favorable verdict before God on judgment day. What a wonderful thing, isn't it, to get a favorable verdict before God. And so... <clears throat> the the thought here is, again in verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed, and the we there is the Jews, speaking as a Jew, we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And then he says this, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And many believe that this last statement, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, is really a, uh, a free translation or citation of Psalm 143, verse 2. I'd like us to go back there, please, back in the Psalms to Psalm 143 and verse 2. And we'll notice this. Psalm 143, verse 2, it says, And enter not into judgment with thy servant. Then it says this, For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For in your sight shall no man living be justified. The translation is, In your sight no one living is righteous. And so basically, uh, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In God's sight, no one living is righteous. No one living is justified in God's sight. And so we're all guilty. We're all guilty sinners, whether Jews or Gentiles. And so the only way we could get declared righteous is, as it states clearly in this verse, by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ.
And so this idea of justified, we've said, it means to be declared or pronounced righteous. It's a legal forensic term connected with the law court. And it is the opposite of condemnation. What we were before we believed in the Lord Jesus, before we exercised faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, was condemned. But now we're declared righteous. We were sinners guilty and condemned, but God, in the wonder of his grace, and because of the work of Christ, has declared us righteous, cleared us of every charge against us the moment we believed that message, the gospel. This new relationship is entered into by us through faith in Christ. No works or merit on our part could ever have secured it for us. It's all of God's grace. How it humbles man's pride. So Paul presses home to the Jews the utter inadequacy of the law to give them any standing because he says, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's a strong and definite and sweeping statement. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so a man is not justified by, and of course, any man is not justified. Grace eliminates, in a sense, the difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to justification. By the works of the law, no flesh should be justified. And so that a man is not justified, any man not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to be saved by faith? in Jesus Christ, not dependent on our own works, our own efforts, by trying to comply to the law or any legalistic thing. No flesh could be justified in that way. So Peter, Paul is saying, we're not justified by being under the law of Moses, but by faith in Jesus, by refusing fellowship with Gentile Christians. You're saying in your actions, Peter, that that's only true in part. They're only considered right before God by faith in Christ plus the works of the law. If you're putting them back onto that, you're saying that Christ's death is not enough. And Paul could not bear that, that idea that the law, uh, the, the gospel, faith in Christ, needed a supplement. That's an insult to the very uh, message of the gospel of Christ. And so he says in verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. So now we ask, well, what's, what does he mean by this verse? And really what he's, I believe, taking up here now is an objection that certain men from James would raise. You see, he says, if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. See, it's one thing to be declared righteous, and that's true of all of us. If, we're, if we've believed the gospel, every one of us are declared righteous. It's a legal standing. It can never be changed. Praise God for that. But the problem is, those of us have been declared righteous. We know from experience that sometimes we don't live righteous. We're still sinners, <laughs> right? My, uh, although as far as the law court's concerned, I'm declared righteous, I still have a propensity to sin. And even though I'm saved and I know I'm saved, I'm still, I still have a problem with sin. And so the Judaizers were saying, you see, that's the problem. This justification by faith is inadequate. It, it's still causing people, people are still sinners. In fact, Christ must be the minister of sin if if it's only by justification by faith and people continue to sin. So that's why they need to go on the law as well to help them live right now that they're declared right, you see. So it's kind of this additional thing is needed. Christ, the minister of sin, because Jesus' work of making them right with God apparently didn't make them right enough. If God justifies bad people, what is the point of being good? Can't we do as we like and live as we please? You know, that's the, the biggest argument that we get against the message of justification by faith is you're saying all you got to do is believe. That means you can live as you want. 
right? That's that's the general mentality. You, you're saying you can live exactly how you want. It doesn't really matter as long as you believe in Christ. You know, you can you can go out and do all these things, and that's the kind of logic that people use against justification by faith and so that's where they say well it's okay to get saved that way but to live you have to have the rules we've got to give you the rule book and and if you keep the rules plus you believe then hopefully you'll make it and so that's the mentality and so if we seek uh, while we seek to be justified by christ we ourselves have found sinners is therefore christ the minister of sin and how does he respond to that god forbid perish the thought you see by making their their thinking is by making him forsake the law and trusting christ alone that they're basically um it's going to cause people to sin and the res resounding answer is god forbid it's unthinkable that christ should be the minister of sin now let's just think about how we would respond to this you see, justification by faith does not make us think lightly of sin. On the contrary, it creates in us such a love to God that we loathe the very idea of offending him. For the tendency of the gospel of grace is to excite gratitude in those who receive it. If I am freely pardoned, then I must love him who has thus generously forgiven me. Gratitude is the root of true virtue and the mainspring of all holiness. I think that's really true, isn't it? It was once we realize what Christ has done for us, would I now want to live a life that dishonors him? No, he's done so much for me. Surely the thought is, well, I want to live to please a savior like this. I want to magnify him. I want to glorify him. He's done so much for me. So out of sheer gratitude, the idea is uh, we don't want to offend him. And so that's what the, the legalistic people miss, that the greatest motivation for godly living is actually grace. Recognizing what the Lord has done for us makes us want to please him. He's such a marvelous, gracious, kind, loving savior I don't want to hurt a person like this. I don't want to dis discredit his character in any way. I'd like to live for him for the rest of my days. And so, uh, and of course, so many uh, things that we read, uh, uh, some of the great hymns, they're all about that, aren't they? When we, when we consider that amazing love of Calvary, uh, how it causes us to want to respond. And so certainly that is the, the thought here. God forbid, perish the thought. And then he goes on and he says in verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Building again the things that I once destroyed. Paul puts it to Peter in this way. Do you want to tell the world that justification by faith through grace alone is a mistake? That really the old way was right after all? that the right way to go is by means of keeping the law by being circumcised, to abstain from certain kinds of foods, to go back to that old system that didn't do anything for us. We can well imagine that Peter had no answer to the argument. He could only agree with Paul. Peter had implied he had been originally wrong to abandon keeping the law as a means of justification. And Paul agrees that if salvation really was by the works of the law, then he too was a transgressor. To build again the things they have so deliberately destroyed was to make themselves transgressors in having destroyed them in the first place. <clears throat> by yielding to faith in Christ as a means of salvation, we abandon law-keeping as a means of being justified. We acknowledge that we're sinners, wholly dependent on God's grace. Jew and Gentile alike have no other way of being justified before God. So when a person sets about rebuilding something that he once acknowledged was useless and fit only for demolition, what is he doing? He is implying that he has made a mistake. Paul is saying, is that what you want to convey, Peter? Is that the message you want to give to the world? 
that actually you made a mistake when you went to Cornelius' household, that you made a mistake uh, when you gave us that right hand of fellowship, uh, that we we didn't need to circumcise Titus. Remember, he was there as a test case. Are you telling us that that was all a mistake and you're trying to rebuild again that which you once destroyed? If once said, I would not trust in my good works and now go back to trust in them, whatever my outward conduct is, I have perpetrated a great sin. And that's exactly what's going on here. These certain men from James thought they had to hang on to the law for themselves and impose it on Gentiles, thinking that there wouldn't be as much sin. What Paul shows, actually, is by putting themselves under the law again, they were sinning worse than ever because they were rebuilding the very thing that they had destroyed. How is it a sin to build again uh, a way uh, to God through the law of Moses? In many ways, but perhaps the greatest is that it looks at Jesus hanging on the cross, taking the punishment we deserved, bearing the wrath of God for us, and saying to him, that's all very nice, but it's just not enough. That's exactly what they're saying. Your work on the cross won't be good enough before God until I'm circumcised and eat kosher. This is the greatest insult a person could ever make to the Savior. To actually say that his work, which he claimed was finished, is insufficient. It needs all these legal things as well. And that's the great tragedy of legalism. In trying to be more right with God, legalists end up being less right with God. That's the, exactly the situation of the Pharisees that opposed Jesus so much during his earthly ministry. Paul knew it well because he himself had been that Pharisee. And so the answer is a resounding no. Christ is not the minister of sin. And Paul was not a transgressor in any way because he had been consistent. Peter is the one in going back to that old system, who is actually making himself a transgressor. So now Paul, in verses 19 through 21, explains the new life in Christ that is so much better than anything the legal system could ever impose upon us. He tells us in verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. He not only repudiated the law as a means of salvation, he says, I died to it. So I can't return to it because I died to it. Looking back, he sees his whole experience under law proved its inadequacy as a means of salvation. It only brought despair and condemnation, making constant demands without giving the power to fulfill it. And that's what law does. It tells you this is what you're supposed to do, but it gives you no power to do it. And, and so it couldn't give life, but instead it brought death. In fact, it says when he came to know the law, he said it slew him. <laughs> it, 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 it revealed his lostness, and it proved him to be a sinner and then punished him for being one. That's what the law does. And he said, I'm dead to that. How did that happen? Now, I want you to notice when we read verse 20, we want to pay attention. We always need to pay attention, but the pronouns are so prevalent in this verse. We're going to see that uh, in this verse, I and me, as many as eight occurrences of I and me. He, Paul's talking about his personal experience in coming to see the inadequacy of the law and his death to the law and his now being united to Christ. And so, I want you to notice, just as we read it, the, the I's and the me's. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the way, the gospel is a very personal thing, isn't it? 
Isn't it wonderful? I mean, we know that he loved the world. Uh, we, we, we know that he, the Lord loved humanity, but isn't it wonderful to come to that realization? He loved me and he gave himself for me. And so Paul is talking about the very personal aspect of where he came to in his experience. The law condemned him. The law uh, was ready to punish him. It showed him for what he was. But where does he find himself now? And what he says is true of all believers, but he's just telling us his personal experience. He says this, I am crucified with Christ. Now, by the way, this, this thought of being crucified with Christ is a matter of divine revelation. We would never have known such a thing had taken place unless the scripture said it. We know Christ died for me. <laughs> we know that from scripture, but we didn't know that the the I died with Christ, right? That we only get that from revelation, from from the Word of God, and so. He, but it's true; it's a true statement of all believers. I am crucified with Christ. It, it is a matter of divine revelation. We, we we would never known that such a thing had taken place unless God had told us. And so, when we read the Gospels, we're reading only what took place outwardly. We must go to the epistles for the doctrine of the cross. If we want to understand the full significance of the cross, we get the historical events surrounding the cross in the Gospels. But in the epistles, we get their full doctrinal implication of the cross of Christ. And, and so it's a doctrinal statement to be accepted by the believer. And uh, often it's used in relation to holy living, but certainly in the context here, it primarily means that Paul, and the believer too, has died to the law in identification with Christ, who bore its penalty. Okay, so we're going to see later on, he's going to talk about cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, and, and Christ being made a curse for us. Christ bore, as it were, the penalty of the law. And when he did that, I died with him. I died with Christ. And so uh, the law is done with me as far as it's concerned because it's already exacted its penalty in Christ. And so the idea is this. He died to the law in identification with Christ who bore its penalty. As such, it has no more claim upon him and he has no responsibility to keep it because it's already dealt with. He he bore the punishment in the person of Christ. You see, he, he I'm crucified with Christ. So when he bore the full penalty of the law, I bought, bore it with him. And so he, he says, As such it has no more claim upon him. He has no responsibility to keep it. He is now in a new sphere, completely living a new life. I am crucified with Christ. And nevertheless, I live. It's very evident. He's still alive. <laughs> and so uh, how does he live now? When Christ died, he not only died for our sins and bore the curse of the broken law, but he died to remove the man who had committed the sins and broken the law. I, the old man that did all those things, died with Christ on the cross. When he died, I died with him. And so... In the present experience, it's it, it's reckoned to have taken place at the cross. We could say, I have been crucified with Christ. But the reality of it, even though it my identification took place when Christ died, the reality lives in our souls right now. Let us grasp that grasp the significance of it. I am identified with Christ in his death. The cross means the end of me as a sinner. As one seeking to earn salvation by my own efforts, it all died at the cross. It's all ended there. It's the end of my old self, the sinful evil I has gone. Now, it doesn't mean the believer no longer lives. As an individual, he does, but it's no longer the old I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And again, notice this. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Life is no longer self-centered, but Christ-centered. The cross has taught him that the old life is finished. He has entered into a new experience 
in which Christ is living out his life in him. He says this, this Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, that's speaking of in the body. So this, this body of mine now, what, what is the life I'm living? It's the expression of the indwelling Christ being manifested through our lives, living in dependence on the indwelling Christ. And so the flesh doesn't refer to the, uh, refers here to the body, uh, which the new life is manifested, but it's a life of faith and not obedience to an external code. Christ lives in me, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that Paul lived did not consist of law-keeping, but the outworking of the indwelling Christ living in him. And so it's a life of faith depending on that indwelling Christ to manifest his life through us. Life lived unto God for his pleasure, not striving to keep the law, but a life lived in dependence upon Christ as Son of God. And again, the, the, the fact that he mentions here, the Son of God, of who loved me and gave himself for me. The reason he mentions it as the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me is the idea of this is the exalted eternal son. And so he, he can't get over the fact that one so great loved him and voluntarily gave himself for him. And then we come to our final verse on which we'll close. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He cannot set aside or make null and void the grace of God by going back to law-keeping. And in one sense, if a man can be saved by his own works, by his own willings and his own doings, then Christ's death was unnecessary. It was, a, it was an unnecessary piece of torture. Instead of being the most glorious manifestation of divine love, it was a shameful waste putting upon Christ a terrible burden of suffering that was totally unnecessary. And that's why works religion is such an abomination to God, because it makes the death of Christ meaningless. If we can do it ourselves, what was the point in him dying? But the bottom line is we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't keep the law. We couldn't keep our own standards. We couldn't keep any of those things because by nature we're sinners and rebels. And so the only hope for us is the grace of God. And the thing that frustrates the grace of God more than anything is people committed to works religion. God wants to unleash his grace through faith in the finished work of Christ to all that will believe. And why are not more believing? Because they're frustrating the grace of God. <laughs> because they're thinking that it's by human effort. And Peter... Oh, Peter, realize the serious implications that you're involved in, in going back to that system that you once sought to destroy. May God encourage us not to be intimidated and to live in the enjoyment of the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. <laughs>